Welcome to the shop. I'm Jared and this is the Questionable Garage. And you know what? We are answering a question today. You guys have been asking a tremendous amount about a particular car in the fleet. What's going on with it? Why haven't we gotten any updates? Have you given up on the project? Well, unlike other channels, we don't give up on projects. We get them done. Sometimes it just takes a little while. But uh, are you guys ready for it? It's not the Tesla. No, 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 no. We are going to jump back in a time machine because I have been doing slow, just, you know, chipping away little bits at a time. We then sent the car off to our friends Randy and Ridge at GRC to do some fabrication on the car for us while we were working on try hard all to get this thing ready for hopefully an event coming up in November, which is not very far away. But unlike so many times before, it is almost ready to start. So. We're not gonna to tease too much longer what car we're working on. I'll show you in just a second, but we are gonna go back in time, enjoy some time-lapse footage of us doing a little bit of work. We've been working on this thing for a while. Now, if you don't know who I'm talking about, not the Tesla, it's Earl Leaker. Look at that. Now, if you don't know who Earl is, Earl Leaker is our 1990 Nissan 300Z that started off life as a Nissan V8 swapped car. Then we started to put a 2J in it. Then Tavar stole the 2J back that I stole from him and it was left with no purpose. And then I hung out with Derek at Vice Grip Garage at a Cletus and Cars event and fell in love with burnout cars. So I decided the most practical car to build is our small Nissan with a massive 454 engine. certain this is the world's most expensive two bolt main big block. Sitting on the back of our insane 454 is an FTI transmissions. This is basically their top of the line power glide short of a billet case. Well, that's a thing. It's so close and we are so, so far away. Well, welcome to the time machine where we're going all the way back to the Transcon ambulance hanging out in the shop. We don't even have our new Harbor Freight toolbox yet and the 300ZX is inside. Now, one of the things I decided early on for our burnout car build is I wanted a rear mounted radiator, which first required removing the rear glass. Now, logic would say just break it out with a hammer. We don't have any use for it, but I didn't want to clean up the glass. So instead, I spent a whole lot of time carefully cutting it out. With the glass removed, it was time to start playing with the position of the radiator. Once I knew where the radiator was gonna sit, it was time to kind of play with a transmission cooler. Initially, I wanted to go ahead and mount it in the rear of the car. Hi. You wanna say hi to everybody? All oh, these tail. Hi. Here, sit. Oh, stretch first. Sit. Good girl. Hi, Pat. Oh, you're actually listening on camera for once. Can I get a shake? Here, a shake. Oh, wait. Oh, shake. There you go. Making me grab it. Hi, Pat. Beg. Oh, 
And that is why the vet says she's a little overweight, because she begs really good, and somebody gets all the table scraps, doesn't she? With the radiator figured out, it was time to start laying out some of the wiring harness to make this engine work. Most everything was straightforward. It was just a matter of getting it fed through an appropriate hole and then plugging it into where it needed to go. Next up in getting this car up and running is we needed to get spark plug wires made. Now, one common thing that happens to engines like this is you end up burning a spark plug wire. So we're running a ceramic booted 90 degree Excel plug wire. And since there's no specific application, I had to build everything myself, carefully rooting it, keeping everything away from heat and sharp objects as much as possible and crimping and putting the boot ends on. Well, all right, let's show you guys what we are working on right now on our 300Z burnout car. We have got a rear differential out on the table, Jared. Why do you have Earl's rear end taken apart on the table? Shouldn't it be in the car if you want to make it work? Well, yes, but there's one small problem. This rear differential is what's called a viscous limited slip. It's like a traditional limited slip. They have breakaway torque, and this one is slightly worn out. With it in the car, I was able to grab the wheels and spin them opposite of each other, which means the breakaway torque of this differential is too low, and puts us at big risk of doing a one wheel burnout, which is not what you want when you're trying to win a competition. You need both tires going as fast as possible, not just one. So there's a simple, simple trick to fix this. Well, there's two options. One, we can take it all apart. We can buy all new clutches and shims and tighten it up, or we can make what's called a Lincoln locker, or in our case, a Vulcan locker. We're gonna weld it up now. You would think because it's limited slip, you can't, but you're able to. Honestly, welding an open differential is a lot easier. You have more access to everything, but we are still able to get in and weld enough of this thing to lock it up. The drifters do it a whole lot, and it's uh, it's a thing we can do. Now, you may ask yourself, Jared, how do you know if your R200 Nissan differential is a viscous limited slip? One, most often, if it has big cooling fins, it is likely a viscous limited slip. I've also heard there's sometimes some other indicators um, that it's a viscous limited slip differential. I haven't found them yet, but I've, I've heard Nissan is really good about marking their differentials. So <laughs> what I've already done is I've blasted this with water. Brake clean is commonly used. The only problem I have with that is it's flammable. And when you're welding, if you missed some of it in your preheating, you're going to have a big fire blow up in your face. But our goal, similar to when you are doing an open differential, you need to lock spider gears to your case. Ooh, it's kind of warm. So what we'll be doing is going through these cracks. We're going to weld the plate to the case. We're going to weld that spider gear to the plate and then to the case. And then coming in through this hole, slamming my lens in, you can't really see much. We're not able to get quite as much in there, but we're able to get some of the spider gears. Just imagine there's spiders in there wiggling around. We're gonna lock those the best that we can to the case and then fully weld that surface in. And we're only gonna do this one side. Short of taking it all apart, you really can't lock this plate to the case on the opposite side because it's fully shrouded by, by the ring gear. You have options of buying the parts to rebuild this and just build it at a higher breakaway torque. The problem is parts are between like $800 to $1,300. So we're not losing anything by welding and modifying a Viscous R200. There are way better diff options for basically the cost of fixing us. I'm going to get this thing welded up, get it back in the car, and then we go on to wiring. And we might fire this thing up finally. We are so close. I also still got to lower it down and show you all the stuff I dropped off at Randy's to get done for us. There's just a ton of just small, heavy fabrication work that we were in the middle of the try hard build. So I brought it to Randy and gave him some money and said, hey, can you get the stuff knocked out for me? And uh, the GRC guys did an awesome job on all the little stuff. So we'll show that once the rear ends in the car and we're back down on the ground and wiring.
Anytime you're welding up a differential, go ahead and protect your bearings and gear surfaces with some foil tape or aluminum foil. It does great, keeps them safe, and you're able to get your differential locked up and doing what you want it to do. Now, one thing you'll notice is I'm going through and burning up all of our spider gears together to give us one locked spool differential. I had to turn the welder back down. In the past, I'm used to welders where you can pretty much just run them at max capacity in order to sufficiently weld spider gears together. Well, this Vulcan at full capacity was obliterating the spider gears. It turns out when they say three eighths of an inch, they mean three eighths of an inch. So, uh, cranked it down and we got everything burnt up to give us a nice full locker. Alrighty, we got her welded up. Now, you don't necessarily on one of these have to fully fill this in. It's more heat you're putting into the case that can potentially cause fatigue issues, but I went ahead and did it. You wanna bridge everything as much as you can in there. You may ask, Jared, why did you put the stub in? On this differential, the two transfer plates, this has to feed through both of them. So if you just welded it, they could be out of phase and you'll never get it back together. So this needs to run through, have everything lined up correctly. Also, there's really no way that you can get to this when you're welding it. So keep it in the whole time. If you want, you can spot it together, then knock it back out. Total personal preference. So this is cooled down enough. We'll get it knocked apart put back into the case. We will fill this thing up with a little bit of Valvoline gear lube and get it stuck back in the car. With our freshly welded diff back in the car, it was a matter of getting all of our bolts back into place. And then we went ahead and drained all of the old gasoline out and then filled up the differential with some fresh Valvoline to get it ready to go. And with everything wrapped up underneath, it was time to get some paint on all of the metal in the trunk, which involved pulling the radiator out, scuffing some of the rust out, vacuuming, cleaning it up, and wiping it all down with prep ball. Now you'll notice I've got some eye protection and breathing protection on. Guys, don't skimp on safety equipment. Take the time, put it on, keep yourself safe. with everything freshly coated in a bright shade of red, we get ourselves a new frostbite radiator mounted in there because unfortunately the other one got some damage to it while uh, Earl was moving around. We got our Dash 20 hoses fished up. We're bolting in our water pump and getting all of our connections finalized to have our nice rear mounted cooling system done. Alright, let's go underneath this whole car. We got that rear differential in and I told you we'd talk about some of the things that we had Randy do and we went ahead and got done ourselves kind of in the long time that we've been kind of just chipping away at Earl and getting him ready. There's been quite a few changes and we are so close to starting him. Not in today's episode. Guys, I'm sorry. I'm out of time. I've got a road trip. We've got SEMA to visit and a whole lot of other things to do, but I wanted to show you progress we're making on Earl because we're trying to make November Cletus and cars. There's still a whole lot to do, 
and a whole lot of other things going on, but we are, we're doing our best to finally let Earl do what uh, we wanted to do with him. So we come back into the back and obviously the cooling system is drastically different. You saw us in the far time ago time lapse working on getting a radiator mounted in the back here and you can now see some coolant lines. We're not gonna talk about being cool yet. We're gonna talk about something else cool. So one of the things Ridge and Randy at GRC knocked out for me are some tread cutters. Now the design of the body, we couldn't quite kick them all the way out. That would be ideal. But the purpose of these things, they're actually truck frame. It's angle iron off of a truck frame um, that they've sharpened to a point. I had them build them out this far because I'm not sure the final size of our burnout tire. But as they start to come apart, one of the most damaging things to the car are those little straps of rubber as it's flailing around. So the purpose of these tread cutters are to cut the tread off. As that rubber starts to swing around, they get sliced off and thrown up and away. Now let's talk cooling. You'll notice we have a big hole in the floor that I just made for the car. That's to help get airflow moving through the whole back of the car. We actually even cut out that section just to give room for air to move. We have got 20 AN running front to back, obviously rear mounted radiator. It's gonna help us that if we ever nose the car in or we ever reach phase, I think it's like phase seven at this point for Earl. He's had so many variations between Earl chassis one, Earl chassis two, with uh, Andrew working on it with the Nissan V8 to the 2JZ to now the big block and all these things. There's even one more level up of Earl if the chassis makes it. Um, so I needed all the room in the front that I could have. Plus, again, bumping the nose of the car in is not uncommon. So we ran 20 AN. Now, if you have ever priced this stuff out, you know how expensive it is. These fittings alone are the 80 to $180 a piece, depending on the style that you go with. The 20 AN braided stainless, it's not cheap on its own. And as you can tell, we've got a lot of it. But I did not want to risk blowing a coolant line. Like The number one problem with these burnout cars is they overheat or pop coolant lines. So a good way to do not pop a coolant line is AN hose. So we're good there, I think. We've got our rear end back in and welded. I actually think we have it in park. Nope, we don't have it in park. So all of everything spins in perfect unison now, which is exactly what we want to destroy. Tires, I will come through here. These are some pull throughs that Randy cut on his plasma table. For our seat belts on the inside, we got our Simpson harnesses and that's there. Um, generally in a burnout, you're not running the speeds to crash and rip through the floor, but it's better safe than sorry. He bent up these really nice brackets to keep our coolant hose tucked up. Again, we've got a driveline services of North Georgia out of Norcross drive shaft in here. We went with aluminum because it gave us kind of the most strength for size, space constraints. Carbon fiber would be ideal. We don't have a carbon fiber budget. Um, the reason carbon fibers are really nice in a drive shaft is when they break, they basically turn into a giant broom. They shatter, all of the epoxy gets whipped out of it and you have just the strands spinning around and they kind of clean the bottom of your car. You know, it's, it's really nice of them. Whereas, you know, the steel and aluminum shafts when they break, they just rip giant holes in everything. So let's just not break a drive shaft. Going forward, you'll notice our transmission cooler. This is not the original one we were trying to fit. Uh, the Earl's one in the back, I was, I was kind of going back and forth, running our hoses all the way to the back versus mounting an already, this is pretty substantial sized cooler and I already had hoses that would work perfectly for it. So we went with that mounted underneath. It's gonna have plenty of airflow. We've got that awesome FTI power glide, way more transmission we need, but I love it. Uh, mainly it's less likely to break. And when they break, they like to throw parts at your feet and legs, um, which is not a good time. So we've actually got, you can kind of see it. We've covered it in a previous episode as well. The FTI case, you know, ballistic shield. Plus we built ridiculously thick steel floors all around it. And then up here, not a whole lot has changed other than we've got a pulley. I need to get bolts into that. And then we need a turnbuckle and we can run our alternator. But that's kind of the big changes for underneath. 
I'm really excited. I don't have my battery yet. I got to follow up on it. If everything works out, we're going to have a pretty awesome battery for Earl. When I say way overkill, I mean way overkill. It's a battery that, if my math is right, and there's like a 38% chance my math was right, we could theoretically run Earl at maximum electrical load, meaning cooling fans full tilt, trans fan at full tilt, maximum ignition load output, the computer running full load, fuel pump at maximum amperage draw, the cooling fans at everything at maximum amperage draw, we theoretically can run for six minutes with no alternator. Again, one of the things that happens is a lot of times in burnout cars, they throw their belts and you lose your alternator. And when you're running an electric water pump and electric fans and everything, they then overheat. So in theory, I don't even need an alternator. So it's just kind of a bonus to keep things maintained. And the battery we're hopefully getting for Earl, which you'll see in next Earl episode, if it all works out, operates and is designed to work in total loss, meaning it's designed to go from fully charged to fully empty, fully charged, fully empty. And that's what it is meant to do. Some batteries really don't like that, but it's within, you know, what it's designed to do. So fingers crossed that works out. We're going to have such an overkill battery that I'm really excited about. So uh, let me lower the car and let's talk about the things that are on top. And we're going to wrap up this episode. So, uh, so on the top side, not a ton has changed. Again, Randy made a real nice alternator bracket for me. Actually, you can kind of see the punch list on that side and a couple of the things I've got to order left on that side. We got our throttle cable now put together. Randy got this bracket set up. We're using a Motion Raceworks cable to a little bit of the bracket setup that comes that you can buy from uh, Wyand. Slightly modified to do everything we need to get our full throttle going here. At some point, I'll figure out a way to have these flaps open, but I think initially I may just go ahead and remove them. You know, we'll put the bird catcher on it, but we'll just not have those valves in initially. So we're looking pretty good up here. One thing you'll notice is we got a uh, discharge nozzle. So what is that discharge nozzle for? Oh, you can't really see it. We are running fire suppression. A lot of guys don't run fire suppression. They run the get out and run away from it. I don't really care about Earl burning down to the ground. If it happens, it'll stink. But what I do care about is my 454 two bolt main that somehow turned into like a $14,000 engine. We've got really amazing cylinder heads on it. We got a ton of amazing parts in the bottom end of it. So if we ever just absolutely crash Earl, it burns to the ground. I would really like to save this engine so we can put it, you know, into an appropriate old classic Chevy, something that deserves a ridiculous 454 like this. So nothing against Earl here, you know, Earl's a good, Earl's a car, um, but I think, I think we got a little too much engine for him. It's perfect for burnout. So we've got all of our fuel system routed. You've got a brake master cylinder there. That's one other thing Randy knocked out for me. We now have everything ready for me to run brake lines. We've got a seat fitted, which was a big problem. A 300 is a very small car and I am not a very small American. So I had bought some of the seat brackets. Randy ended up just having to go full custom to give me just, just enough headroom to fit in there. They welded in a crossbar just for the harnesses. Harness, there's not plural. We are running the factory fuel tank. We're not running a fuel cell in it because that hump right there is where the fuel tank lives on a 300Z. If I am ever doing a burnout and hit the wall enough that that fuel tank gets broken, I'm in trouble. I, it's, it's, it's a very safe position in the car for a fuel tank. It's in front of the rear axles. It's, you know, a couple feet on either side in board. So it is a very safe fuel tank and there was no reason to get rid of it. Um, and it allows me to use the factory hard lines. They're going to flow enough that we need to support our engine. It's all good. Uh, one other thing we need to do is our ABS pump assembly. All of that's going to get pulled out. Um, we're not going to use any of the brake lines. We're running a single master cylinder that tees off to the front wheels and uh, goes master cylinder into that one chrome lever. Some of you guys might know what that lever is. Not everyone else will. Uh, this is the cheapest of cheap uh, for the rear brakes, which pretty much will never get used. 
I probably should have just called up Twisted Images and gotten a good one. You know, $30 off Amazon. How? That's terrible. I, I, I have very low expectations. But I also have a traditional parking brake there. We've got a quick car wiring set up there. We got our start button, power in, all of our switches that we're going to be able to control, fuel fans, what we need there. Randy just built an amazing little kind of command console there. I'm, I'm really happy with how that came out. We have got some heat insulation, and again, everything sealed up there. That plate right here is removable so we can service fluids and get into that uh, FTI power glide as we need to, but really... Hopefully we won't. We've got our wires coming through here for our Holly Terminator. Still need to get that mounted up and wired. That's just not for today. Now let's go to our cooling system. So you saw us fighting a whole lot with the rear glass and was trying to make things work in the back. And then ultimately I just, I did a whole lot of cutting. And here we go. We went with red. I asked my wife what color she thought and she wanted red for the, you know, the cooling area. So we're red here. Uh, we do use red in the, the crushable garage, and I, I actually kind of like how that came out. It's, it's very bright, looks really cool. But we got our big frostbite radiator. We got our Spall twin fans here mounted in. What I like about their fan shroud is they've got these kind of universal brackets you can get that lock in that really make mounting it secure a breeze. So really happy with that came out. I built my stands originally. Randy really didn't like my upper mount, so he built these that honestly do look a whole lot better and other things they built they built this firewall setup for me so there was the one incident at a cars where unfortunately unfortunately one of the rear mounted radiators let go and sprayed coolant directly on the driver realistically um i've gone you know that that's a new safety requirement having a physical separation there's basically no holes i kind of built the car for my safety beyond what they asked for in the rules. Randy did an excellent job fully, you know, divorcing that area from me. We kicked it back a little bit more just to kind of give a slight bit more room in the front so we could kick the seat back. Ideally, you know, a slight angle would have been nice for a little more airflow down to the radiator, but there is lots of room here. It's gonna be able to just pull all the air that it can pull through those fans through this area. I am. I'm thrilled with how this is coming out. We are kind of, again, there's a simple recipe, nitrous, LS, and a pickup truck, and you're gonna do really well. But I don't wanna do just really well. I want to kind of follow up on what we did with the BMW. Show up and just clean the clock. We are building the absolute best ridiculous car we can. And half of burnout cars are just the showmanship and... <laughs> Now you may not believe it, but there is some strategy also built into the particular angle I went with. Instead of straight up, you get a little bit of the smoke blow to the top and it looks cool. But there's a reason we went with angles. Maybe you know, maybe you don't. But I hope you guys appreciate this kind of update and uh, I'm getting you guys wrapped up. Those We started months and months ago, just little bits of chipping away at Earl. And we are almost ready to fire him up. In the next episode, we're going to be plumbing the brakes. We're going to be wiring it up. We're going to fill the cooling system up. And then we are going to be firing up this junkyard 454 that is built to the 9s, the 10s, the 11s, the 12s, to all of it. We are, I am really excited to fire this thing into life and get it finally running. <laughs> We're right there, and it's going to be insane. And I appreciate you guys watching these episodes, allowing me to build cars that make absolutely no sense and shouldn't exist. But because you guys watching, I'm able to do it. So I'm Jared reminding you guys to always make questionable choices and build, build stupid cars. Like, why wouldn't you want to do this? Really? Build stuff like this. See ya.